Hi, everyone. Uh, let me just say again what an honor it is to be presented with this Pressburger Award. Uh, thanks very much to the committee. Uh, it's really exciting for me. And I'm particularly excited uh, right now to share with you a little bit about uh, my approach to research, what I do, and also sort of how I got there. Um, our story begins when I was uh, five years old. This is me. I've changed a little bit. Um, and this is my father. And we had a puzzle company called the Eric and Dad Puzzle Company. And we made and sold these wire take-apart puzzles to toy stores across Canada. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We uh, split the money 50-50. Uh, and uh, this is the beginning of my interest in puzzles, certainly, and I think ultimately mathematics and algorithms, and also the beginning of my collaboration with my father, which has been really, uh, really great over the years. Uh, many of you know Martin Domain, and he'll be cited at various times in this talk. Um, our next big adventure was traveling around uh, mostly the east coast of the United States. Uh, this is over a period of four years when I was ages 7 to 11. Uh, we lived in about 10 different places. Started in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I was born. Um, and in the beginning, we made a lot of stops till we found uh, places we wanted to stay for a bit longer. And so we tried out homeschool, where my dad would teach me at home. Um, and that turned out to be a really effective way for me to learn and a very flexible way for me to learn kind of whatever I wanted in addition to the baseline. Um, and had other really nice uh, positive side effects. Uh, for example, it kind of opened my peer group. So normally, in most schools, at least in the United States, uh, you tend to just talk to uh, your grade level, people of exactly the same age. Um, and it, with homeschool, that's not really so, there's not the same structure to encourage that kind of behavior. And so I would talk to people, young, kids younger than me, uh, adults who were neighbors or living nearby, and just chat with them and learn from them and hang out with them. And that was a really effective way for me, I think, to uh, just learn to collaborate with people of different kinds of backgrounds uh, and different ages. And that's, I think, influenced me a lot today, which I'll be getting to. Uh, but this was our big adventure. Uh, after I, I did my university studies at, in Canada, at Dalhousie in Halifax and uh, Waterloo in Ontario. Um, and for the last 12 years, I've been a professor at MIT. And my father has also been at MIT for that period. Um, now he's an artist in residence in computer science. This is the computer science building. It's a crazy, cool Frank Gehry building, a creative space to be in, especially cool for a geometer like myself. Um, and it's also a great place to explore lots of different directions, not just computer science, but there are a lot of tools in this building for building different types of things, not just robots, but also things like sculpture, which we've been exploring a lot uh, recently. So um, I wanted to structure the rest of the talk about some kinds of lessons uh, to impart on you and say the, the younger generation of theoretical computer scientists. You can take this as advice or ignore it, whatever you like. Uh, but I just wanted to share with you kind of what I think are key to my approach to research and the way I like to do things. Uh, step number one, which I'm very fond of, is having fun. Uh, you'll see that theme uh, throughout the talk. Uh, step number two is to do more than one thing at the same time. Uh, step number three is to collaborate a lot. And step number four is to do so across different disciplines. So I was going to talk about each of these. Uh, we start with having fun. And just to warm things up, this is a, uh, before the Pressburger, my favorite award that I've ever received is the Tetris Master Award from the Harvard Tetris Society. Uh, I didn't even have to play a single game of Tetris to win this award. All I had to do was prove that Tetris is NP complete. Uh, so I think that's kind of funny. Uh, it was awarded on the, uh, in the year 17 Anno Tetri, which is since the invention of Tetris. Uh, so good tongue in cheek. Uh, so one of the things I like to do to have fun is just study games and puzzles that we all know and, and many of us love um, from an algorithmic perspective, from a theoretical computer science perspective. And just to give you an example of that, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the Rubik's Cube, the most famous puzzle in the world. Um, and you probably know it in the 3 by 3 by 3 form, but you can generalize it to an n by n by n cube. And in practice, the largest uh, largest you can commercially buy is a 7 by 7 by 7. The largest that has been made so far is a 17 by 17 by 17. And you can order this uh, online. It's a 3D printed structure. Uh, and I've, I've touched it, held it in my hands, but it's, uh, uh, it's not the smoothest of pieces. So um, once you start generalizing to n by n by n cube, you might wonder, well, how many moves do I need to solve it? And a natural guess, if you know any of the Rubik's Cube solving algorithms, you don't have to for this talk, um, is that, well, the surface area of an n by n by n cube is roughly n squared, is order n squared. And it turns out, in a constant number of moves, you can fix, put into the correct location, a constant number of surface squares. And so a good guess would be roughly n squared moves, order n squared moves. Uh, but it turns out that order of growth is uh, actually pessimistic. You can do a little bit better. I like to say you can kill log n birds with, n, with uh, a constant number of stones. 
um, and get an order n squared divided by log n, and that's tight. And uh, information theoretically, it's kind of obvious that this is tight because in one move, it, one move there are order n choices of what to make. And so at the best, you're getting sort of log n bits of entropy put in in every step. And there's n squared things to fix. And so this is clearly a lower bound, but it turns out you can actually achieve it. I'm not going to describe here how, but it uses some simple uh, coding theory, I guess you could, could say. Um, and that's kind of a fun approach to taking a, uh, a, a fun topic like Rubik's Cubes and studying it seriously mathematically. Uh, on the sort of the other side of the coin, on the comp computational complexity side, it's a lot of fun to take existing uh, games and puzzles. Uh, here I have various uh, Nintendo games, Super Mario Brothers. We've also analyzed things like uh, Legend of Zelda, which I spent way too much time playing as a kid, and ultimately got me interested in computer science. How do people make video games? I asked my dad one day. Um, in these days, I like to analyze these kinds of games and prove that they're computationally intractable, NP-hard, um, or P-space complete, or things like that. Uh, or occasionally you get a video game that can be solved in polynomial time, but most of them are hard. And it's fun to illustrate why they're so challenging for humans using theoretical computer science as a tool. Um, in, in general, you can think of games and puzzles as categorized by how many players you play. That's the x-axis here. So one player game is like a puzzle. Two player games is a typical game. You could imagine a four player game with two teams of two. Uh, and on the other hand, you can think about games that have a bounded length of play, so polynomial number of moves before the game ends, or on this row, an unbounded like exponential number of moves. Um, and for each of these types of games, there is a natural complexity class of uh, deciding whether you can win a game in each of those classes should be uh, polynomial or NP-complete or P-space complete or X-time complete, non-determinist of X-time, uh, or in this case, actually undecidable, which is kind of surprising. This is a finite game, or this is a class of games which are finite number of resources, but still, uh, because they can go on for a long time and you have to think really hard about what all the possible future and past moves could be, uh, there's actually no finite algorithm to solve them. Uh, so that's team unbounded games. And uh, you see in the, in the figure here lots of different examples. Minesweeper has been proved NP-complete. We proved Tetris is NP-complete. Uh, we proved that these sliding block puzzles and rush hour are P-space complete and so on. And then in chess and go, you also get, um, or sorry, this is chess, or checkers and Othello under usual rules is P-space. Uh, chess and go, you get X time and things like that. Uh, so this is kind of fun, again, illustrating why it's hard to play these games, why they're challenging for humans, because they're challenging for computers as well. Um, and a fun little story I thought I'd tell here is of Bob Hearn, who is one of my PhD students. Uh, we ended up writing this book together called Games, Puzzles, and Computation about a new theory called constraint logic. And the goal is to tie together all these different games and puzzles of different types into one unifying framework. And uh, actually, the paper uh, appeared at ICALP in 2009. Uh, I, or I think it was 2009. It might have been a year or two earlier. I think this is the date of the book, which was actually Bob Hearn's PhD thesis. The funny story here is that Bob was actually an AI student uh, doing uh, work related to Minsky-style artificial intelligence. Um, and he ended up TAing for me an algorithms class uh, when I first arrived at MIT. And uh, I mentioned this problem uh, about some of these complexity, and he got kind of sucked in. He just couldn't stop having fun with theoretical computer science. He wasn't even a theoretical computer scientist per se. I mean, that wasn't his main discipline, but he was really good at it. And we developed a really fun theory, I think, to tie all these together, kind of one game to rule them all. Each This one game, which is about reversing edges in a directed graph under very simple constraints, is complete in each of these classes. So if you think of it as a one-player game, bounded, it's NP-complete. If you think about it as a two-player unbounded game, it's X-time complete. And you can use it to prove lots of games and puzzles hard. It's uh, very game-friendly as a reduction. Uh, and it was so productive, we wrote a bunch of papers on this topic, that Bob ended up just writing his PhD thesis, switching over to the fun area of uh, complexity of games, uh, instead of doing the AI for his thesis, because it actually ended up being really productive. Uh, so that's an example of the power of having fun. Um, in general, you might ask why study games and puzzles in particular. And I have a few different answers to this. You can take uh, whichever one you like the most. Uh, a really powerful one is outreach. Um, there's been lots of popular uh, media news articles saying, you know, scientists finally prove Nintendo games are actually hard, uh, which we all knew in the first place. Um, and funny things like that. But it really exposes theoretical computer scientists, theoretical computer science to the general public. And I think that's a powerful idea and something we need to do more of. Um, and it's also, I think, a good way to get new students, say high school students who haven't really thought about what they're, they want to do next, 
uh, to get them excited about theoretical computer science. Computer science gets play through programming and things like that, but how do you express theoretical computer science and real mathematics and what kinds of things you're able to show in that world? And uh, you can expose them to P versus NP and all sorts of fun things through puzzles and games. Um, another motivation and one reason that, that I have done a lot in this area, I think, is just to get new students uh, on board and doing in the research vehicle of theoretical computer science. I think these kinds of problems are very accessible, partly just because they're fun. And everyone has a favorite game or puzzle that probably hasn't been studied. Uh, so they bring some new expertise to the field. And you don't need a lot of background to do a gadget style hardness proof. And there's kind of a clear path of development for sort of known techniques for, OK, I'm going to do a 3SAT reduction. Therefore, I need a clause gadget and a variable gadget and things like that. Um, and so it's, it's kind of easy to, get, to have some guidance. There's tons of examples out there. Uh, and it's, it's, there's a lot of footholds for students to, to grab onto. And so I think that it makes it a nice warm-up project. So a lot of my students will do such a project as their first thing, and then they'll go off into something completely different. Um, but the bottom line is, because it's fun, we like to study them, and people like to read about them. And uh, they're a lot of fun to do and to see. I always like reading these proofs as well, because they always exploit some cool property of the game or puzzle in a neat way. So that was having fun. Uh, somewhat related is doing more than one thing. Uh, because I think it's hard to make a career entirely in the world of recreational algorithms, as I like to call them, uh, doing algorithms purely for fun. Uh, so you need to balance it with other things. And for me, I've, I've studied essentially four main areas. I mean, it's hard to draw the lines exactly, but this is how I presented my tenure case, for example. So I like to do algorithms related to either geometry or data structures or graphs or recreation. Uh, so we talked about recreational algorithms. Um, I'm probably best known for doing computational geometry and computational origami. Lately, I also like to do things like self-assembly and, and protein folding and things like that. Um, and then also, starting when I was a PhD student a little bit later, work in, a lot in data structures, um, lower bounds with, some, with one of my students, Mihai Petrashku. Um, and the, this, is, this is a slide I showed to new students. Uh, so it's like, oh, Google is a data structure we all know. Uh, how do you search the web quickly? How do you store the web to, to support fast searches? And then uh, more recently with my student, uh, Mohamed Taghi Hajiagai, we've been studying uh, graph algorithms through graph miners. And uh, that's been uh, another productive area, which uh, probably many of you know at least one of these areas that I work in. But uh, I really like working in all four uh, for various reasons. Uh, so why do more than one thing? Why am I not just doing computational geometry as my only, as my, my expertise? Because if I work the most in geometry, won't I be the most productive? I claim not. Uh, contrary to some people's advice. And everyone's going to have a different threshold of how many areas they can handle productively. But I think it's really powerful, at the very least, to work on many problems at once. They could be in the same area if you want. But if you work on multiple problems, and I think even better when they're dispersed into very different types of topics, you avoid getting stuck on just one of them. So I know some people who will just focus on one problem and just keep working on it until they solve it or they decide not going to make progress. And I think you can be a lot more productive by having, if you get stuck in a problem, just shelve it for a while, put it on the back burner. You can think about it occasionally, but work on other things where you can be more productive and effective. And this kind of time sharing of your brain will let you be more efficient than if you just work on one thing. Um, kind of related to that idea of time sharing is, is the, the parallel algorithms concept of pipelining, uh, which is you know, every paper has to go through a bunch of stages. First, you have to figure out a problem. Then you brainstorm to come up with a solution. Then you have to write it down, and then debug, edit, publish in a conference, publish in a journal. That's the paper pipeline and, uh, that I'm referring to. And it's nice to have papers at every stage of this pipeline, because uh, in particular, it's kind of boring if all your papers are in the I need to revise it phase, which does happen a little bit too often. Uh, it's nice to have, uh, when you're feeling creative, it's nice to have papers to be creative about. And when you can just brainstorm, think about solutions, send email to your colleagues about different ideas for solution. Uh, when you just want to like get stuff done, uh, if you're in that kind of mood, you can just say, OK, what papers need to be written right now? Uh, this, I have the, the solution, but I just need to write it down, or this paper needs editing. Or uh, when you see some deadline coming up, the next iCalc deadline's coming, it's like, oh, I really should finish that paper. Now's the right time to do it. So if you have, that's really hard to do if you have only papers at the very beginning. And, uh, or have already been published or whatever. It's nice to have lots of papers at different stages, so whatever mood you're in, uh, again, this is about being most productive with your time. Uh, if you do what you feel like you want to do, you will do that the best. And so uh, nice to be able to. And finally, probably the most powerful thing is that you get interactions between these different areas. Um, and so I'll show you some examples uh, between 
computational geometry and data structures. Those are the two areas I've worked in the most. And these are just a few examples of fairly recent papers for me um, about that use connections between those two areas. And because I know both areas, I think these papers were possible. And other of my co-authors knew both areas as well. That, but that was essential to making these papers exist. Without it, if you're just a data structures person or just a geometry person, it wouldn't be possible. So for example, we wrote this uh, sort of paper on geometry of binary search trees. Just the title involves geometry and data structures. And we show a connection between a purely geometric problem, which we probably wouldn't have thought about if we weren't geometers also, uh, and the famous binary search tree dynamic optimality problem. Um, and this is a, another paper uh, with Morella Damian and Robert Flatland, a great last name if you're going to work in geometry. Um, and they're, they're, the three of us are all geometers. I was the only data structures person. And they had written a previous paper on this topic. And I thought, ah, what you need is this data structures topic uh, uh, technique called the heavy path decomposition. It's a very common technique in data structures, but uh, geometers don't typically know it. And it was the right way to solve uh, one of the open problems in their paper. So we wrote a paper about it. Um, and here's another example of using data structures, in this case retroactive data structures, to solve a uh, purely geometric problem, dynamic planar point location. And there's, uh, there are many examples of things like that. This is just one that I happen to be involved in with uh, John Iacono and Stefan Langerman. Uh, in this case, it was almost more of an open problem that we suggested. We could use retroactive data structures to solve this problem. This is a new technique we were inventing. Um, and then later on, it was solved, I think about three years later. Uh, so finally now, there is a logarithmic dynamic planar point location for orthogonal uh, line segments. So uh, point is, by looking at these different areas, you really get more insight uh, than if you just did one. Next topic is collaboration. And I should say these are all interrelated. We're going to get to the same topic. Uh, the prototypical example of ultimate collaboration in mathematics is Paul Erdős. Uh, he had 511 co-authors. Um, and he would just travel the world asking people, so have any problems? and collaborate with them. And it was a really effective way for him to work and also a really nice way for me to work. I enjoy collaborating with, uh, I think, about 320 uh, co-authors so far. Probably some of them are in the audience. Hey, co-authors. Um, this is the list. Um, and I learn a lot from my co-authors. Uh, I, I got into this model of collaboration partly because computational geometry is a fairly collaborative subfield of TCS. TCS in general is pretty collaborative, but computational geometry a little more so, partly because of what I call the Barbados model. So there's this conference center in Barbados, the country, uh, owned by McGill University, uh, which is normally in Montreal. Uh, but they have this facility in Barbados called Bel Airs. And in particular, uh, for the past 30 years or so, Godfrey Toussaint has been running the winter workshop on computational geometry. And I started going to his workshop in 1999. So I was just starting out as a, grad, as a PhD student. I started in 96. So a few years in, I was exposed to this Barbados way of working, which is a bunch of people get together in this very nice environment. And there's very little computers or computer support, networking, the internet is really slow. In the beginning, there was no internet, period. And there's a blackboard and paper, or whatever you bring. And people just work on problems all day. Uh, well, most of the day. Take a lunch break. But uh, it's extremely productive. Um, we get together for a week, and we just solve problems. And it's a very collaborative atmosphere. When I started going, it was just 12 people. And you get to know everyone in that group really tight. Uh, it's gotten a little bigger since then. Uh, this is uh, this year's workshop. Uh, I now co-organize this workshop with Gottfried, uh, which is an honor. And uh, this is really a great way to work. Um, in particular, the concentrated effort for a week and not having to think too much about your regular days, uh, just solving problems. Uh, but all, more importantly, the, the, the collaborative atmosphere of just talking to people, brainstorming, um, coming up with solutions. And then in the end, the model is, uh, everyone decides for themselves which papers their co-authors on. So it comes down to after we leave, we, everyone is assigned to writing the paper, or sorry, for each paper, one person is assigned to writing it as sort of the person in charge, um, and then everyone makes their decision. Okay, I'm a co-author on that paper, not that one. I contributed something here, not here, uh, and it just works. People are really nice about it, and uh, it leads to fairly large number of co-authors on papers. But everyone contributed at least some key piece to that that paper, and I think it's nice to not have to worry about it in. TCS in particular, uh, authors are usually presented alphabetically. So you don't have to worry about exactly measuring your contribution. You just say, well, my contrib contribution was significant. I'm going to be an author. So this gets us to why collaborate. Uh, for me, a big part is just that it's fun. It, it adds a social dynamic to doing research. Whereas if I'm just working alone on my computer, it's kind of boring. And I like talking with people and hanging out. And you know, you can eat food while you're talking about problems. And that makes it more fun. And that's why, you know, that's why everyone is here at this conference, is to make research a social experience as well, not just about doing things. Um, you 
I also like to learn a lot from my collaborators. Um, everybody has their own tool set that they bring, either from uh, their upbringing in, in school uh, or what problems they happen to have worked on. And it's really powerful to combine those tool sets and also to learn each other's tool sets. I think it's really important to always keep learning new things from whoever you can. And collaborators are a great sort resource to do that because they are experts in whatever they know. And so if you can learn their expertise at least a little bit, at least know what it's about, uh, you can be a more powerful researcher. Um, and then the, the sort of the most mundane thing is that if you have n people, usually you can do better than one person uh, for most values of n, let's say. Uh, and my motivation or my uh, justification for why this is the case, kind of a th trying to do theoretical computer science over metaphysics, whatever. Uh, but if you take some theory problem you want to solve, usually you can decompose it into a series of subproblems. This is the top level planning. Okay, I need to solve this and then solve this and then solve this. And if all those pieces work, the whole thing works. Um, and then if you look at any one subproblem, there's probably someone in the world for whom that subproblem is trivial to solve, and they'll just do it because they have the right tool set to do so. On the other hand, if you look at any individual person, there's probably some subproblem that's not so easy. They could do it, but it would just take longer. So if you could instead mix the right collaborators and get at least one person for whom every subproblem is trivial, then collectively you can solve the whole problem much, much faster than if you're just one person or a smaller group trying to solve this problem where you don't, maybe you don't have all the right tools yourself. I mean, ideally you can gather enough tools from your collaborators initially to then go solve whole subproblems problems by yourself. Sure, uh, that's a little less fun for me, but uh, definitely you can solve bigger problems that just no one person can solve if you choose the right mix of people. The challenge, of course, is to get that right mix, but the more people you collaborate with, the more you know what their expertise is and what they, who would be good to bring onto a particular team. So I'll tell you one early story uh, of mine. Uh, this was my PhD thesis. Uh, where we proved the Carpenter's Rule Theorem, uh, that if you take a uh, chain linkage, so think of these as rigid bars, like pieces of steel, and they're connected together at hinges. And so you have to keep these things connected as they are. And they're also not allowed to cross each other. So no bars aren't allowed to intersect. And your goal, given uh, a structure like this, is to unfold it into a straight chain, or equivalently, to take the straight configuration and fold it into something like this. Or a more interesting version is you have sort of a circle of bars and you want to convert it into a desired polygon. So you're not allowed to change the lengths and you have to avoid collision throughout the motion. So that's the rules of the problem. This is open for a quarter, uh, quarter century or so. Uh, and we prove that you can always do it in two dimensions. There's always a, a motion from any configuration to any other, which is useful for motion planning or robot arms and things like that. The uh, question is, how do we prove this? A lot of people had worked on it. I talked, talked about it to many people. Um, and finally, the three of us, Bob Connolly, Gunter Rota and myself uh, proved this in year 2000. And each of us contributed an essential piece of the puzzle. And I think no one of us, and probably even no two of us, could really have solved this. Um, so it started. the story started out, uh, this took place over, I think, mostly 1998 to 2000, so over three years or a little less. Um, and we kept meeting at conferences. So first I met Gunter Rota, and Bob Connolly was also there, but uh, I think we didn't chat too much at the time. Um, in Ascona, Switzerland, geometry conference. And uh, he had this idea, you know, instead of just trying to unfold without colliding with yourself, without getting any collisions in here, maybe we could unfold the linkage while making everything fly away from each other, increasing all pairwise distances, expanding everything. Could that be possible? I thought it was a pretty crazy idea, to tell you the truth. I didn't think this could possibly be true. I looked at lots of examples. Um, and I went back to all these examples and thought, hmm, I guess maybe you could. But how would you prove such a thing? Just a crazy idea. Guntur is very good at that. Uh, and then uh, later on at a conference um, in Hungary, uh, Bob and I got together. And I mentioned this idea of Gunter's. And Bob said, ah, that makes the problem a tensegrity problem. And you may not know what tensegrities are, but Bob turns out to be one of like three experts in the world who knows everything about tensegrities. He was the right person to talk to about this because he had tons of tools of kind of duality related to LP duality, if you're familiar with that. And another cool theorem from really the 17th, 18th century called the Maxwell Cremona theorem. And it just took this problem, which seemed kind of insurmountable, and just translated magically into a pure geometric problem. And then the two of us sat down, and pretty much in a day, we solved the problem. And whoa, that was pretty exhilarating. Uh, I remember at the time uh, making a phone call to my dad. Uh, you know, this is back in the day when you had to pay long distance. It's complicated. I'm pushing all these buttons for a calling card. It's like, Dad, I think we solved the Carpenter's Rule problem. It was, it was really exciting time because um, I've been working on this problem for uh, a bunch of years. 
And then in this fairly short time, the three of us just got nailed it. And it was really all about the collaboration, taking people who had exactly the right expertise and crazy ideas to finish it off. Um, and so it's, in some sense, each subproblem was easy for somebody, uh, but you had to take the combination of the people to make this solution feasible. So that was a little storytelling about collaboration. You should do it. Uh, preaching to the choir, of course, T TCS people do it a lot, but you should do it more, try it more. Last topic, also related to collaboration, is uh, to cross different disciplines. And I'm sure you've all heard of it, interdisciplinary research. You know, it's on the rise. Uh, people do algorithms plus biology, um, algorithms plus uh, economics, algorithms plus anything is interesting. Algorithms in X is, for all values of X, is usually an interesting uh, way to do research. It leads to new insights that you wouldn't necessarily have in, in working in just one of those two disciplines. I want to give you a somewhat unusual example just to make you think more outside the box, which is combining art and sculpture with algorithms. This is a sculpture that my dad and I made uh, just this year uh, based on folding paper. Here's another one. And why math and art uh, or algorithms and art? Uh, for us, uh, my dad's background is actually in the arts, in visual arts. Uh, he did a lot of glass blowing uh, before I was born, for example, and jewelry making, lots of different things. Um, my background's more on the math and computer science side. And you know, we've known each other a long time, as I like to say. Um, and we've taught each other how to be computer scientists and how to be artists. So I've written you know, 100 papers with my dad, and we've made hundreds of sculptures together. And it's a really fun way to work because really it's all about the same thing. It's all about being creative. Uh, in mathematics, you want to prove a theorem, so you have, you have to come up with a, a great idea, a, a conjecture you think is, might, might, might be true, some kind of insight, and then you have to deliver, you have to prove that theorem. Uh, so the medium for mathematics is proof. Uh, in sculpture, it might be paper folding or glass blowing or whatever. Um, so you can think of mathematics as itself an art form, really. Uh, you know, mathematicians don't just want to prove a theorem, they want to find an elegant proof, a, a beautiful proof of that theorem. And that's the ultimate goal. So everyone here is an artist. You're trying to solve mathematics in an elegant way. Um, and sculpture is just another kind of different set of uh, problems to solve, building sculptures or whatever, and different ways to do it, and maybe a different measure of elegance or beauty. Uh, but it's really not that different. We like to do the two of them together. Initially, I got interested in this because uh, we needed to visualize some geometric structures we were interested in. In these, this case, uh, this is exploring what happens when you take a piece of paper and fold along curved creases. How does that work? Uh, we didn't know, so we had to build models to see what was possible. And these are examples of what is possible, and that really helped us visualize the underlying mathematical problems we're trying to solve. Uh, so we find that the art we do inspires the mathematics we do. We see what's going on uh, in different ways. Also. Maybe we have a purely art-driven problem, like, ah, oh, it would be really cool if we could build a sculpture that had this property. But then the question is, does such a sculpture exist? Is there a structure that has that property? And that leads to new mathematical problems. And that's really exciting. On the other hand, the math we do inspires new art because uh, we discover something interesting. We want to express it visually. Let's build a sculpture to do it. So there's a lot of back and forth. And this goes back to the idea I mentioned earlier of different areas within theoretical computer science. Now we're going broader to theoretical computer science and completely different things. And working on both of them together leads to lots of interesting interactions that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So I encourage you to try it, not necessarily with sculpture. Pick your favorite art form or any other discipline in the world. So I'll give you just a couple examples uh, where we've had a lot of productive uh, back and forth between art and mathematics. Uh, one is pleat folding. This is an idea that goes back to the Bauhaus in the late 1920s. Uh, you should try this at home. Take a square piece of paper, fold concentric squares, alternating mountain valley, mountain valley. And it will that piece of paper will pop into this uh, saddle surface, which looks like a hyperbolic paraboloid. Or do the same thing with concentric circles with a hole cut in the center, and you get another kind of saddle surface. We call this self-folding origami, because the paper just pops itself into these 3D forms. How does it do it? It's a natural question. Uh, we've been exploring it over the past 14 years, I guess. We started by developing an algorithm to build sculptures involving these kinds of saddles and joining many of them together. So we built sculpture using algorithms as a tool. Then we went to sort of the more computational side, just tried to simulate what was happening with paper, and got made a sort of paper folding simulator. Once we had this virtual model of what's happening physically over here, we could build a physical sculpture of the virtual model of the physical piece of paper, kind of closing the loop. Uh, so we went from art to math to art. Uh, back to math, we proved that actually this, the concentric square model doesn't exist, whereas the concentric circle model we think does, still haven't proved it. Uh, so math to art to math to art to math to art to math to art. And it's been a really fun adventure going back and forth and just studying this thing and not caring whether we're going to end up producing a sculpture or end up producing a math paper. We've done a lot of both. And it's kind of liberating to not have to worry exactly how you're going to use this result. 
and just try to go with whatever seems natural for what, what you end up discovering. Either you can express it visually through sculpture or express it auditorily through music or whatever it is you're exploring or write a math paper. That was my original goal is just to write papers. Um, it's, we actually are more productive, I think, because we have these different outlets and can get points for both outlets. Uh, here, these are just a few more sculptures uh, that we did uh, in the last year. So it's been a lot of fun. Uh, here we're trying to solve the underlying math problem of if I give you some 3D form, what crease pattern should I put in that will make the piece of paper pop automatically into that 3D form? And we're just trying to explore the design space of what's possible through art. Another example of, of going back and forth between art and math is hinge dissection. This goes back to the late 1800s, early 1900s. This is an example by Dudney, who was actually a puzzle guy. Um, and he came up with this chain of four blocks, four polygons, hinged together at points uh, that folds from an equilateral triangle into a square. Cool example, is it always possible for any two polygons of the same area? No one knows. No one knew, I should say. So we started working on this uh, back in 1999, um, and we started with a fairly simple result, which is if you just look at shapes made out of n copies of a single shape, like n unit squares, kind of like Tetris, but with n uh, area n, uh, then there is a chain of blocks, in this case 2n piece half squares, that you can fold into any arrangement of n squares. So it's kind of a universal chain, can fold into anything you want. And similarly for any sort of regular shape, actually n copies of any uh, given polygon. So that's cool. Uh, relatively easy to prove, but it was an early result for us. Uh, so we were excited. And so we thought, well, it would be fun to express this in the art world. So we, came, we designed a font. Uh, this is a through z, 1 through 9. Uh, also zero, actually. And here we've spelled iCal 2013 with that font. And if you take, say, this letter I, it can be made by this chain of 128 blocks. In principle, you can take this I, refold it into the C, refold into the A, refold into L, into the P, and so on. Also makes a square. Uh, so that was kind of fun. We had to design a font that worked within what we had proved was universally possible. Uh, then we generalize this result to 3D. So uh, for example, if you have n unit cubes uh, that so here is maybe you want to fold from this to this. Each of these has eight unit cubes. You subdivide into eight half cubes, uh, one half by one half by one half, and hinge them together in this way. Repeat this n times, and you can fold that chain universally into any n cubes of unit size. Um, and so then we built that into a sculpture. This is a funny story. Uh, Lori Palmer was visiting uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and she came to us and she said, look, I've got these about a thousand blocks, uh, and um, I have these piano hinges, and we were just working on this paper of unit cubes, and we quickly generalized the result from cubes to parallel pipettes, and boom, we got an interactive sculpture you put on these gloves, and you can refold this chain provably into exponentially many different forms. So that was a very convenient uh, timing-wise collaboration between art and science. And then finally, uh, about uh, five years ago, we proved it's always possible for any two polygons. Actually, you can take k polygons, all of the same area, there's one hinge dissection that can fold into each of them. And there's a generalization of this result to 3D, but it gets a little more complicated. Uh, and you also get, uh, because we have this Carpenter's Rule theorem, we can actually fold those chains without self-intersection during the motion. Uh, this result is a bit theoretical. It's a bit complicated. Uh, it uses a lot of pieces. But it was nice to, after uh, about a decade, we finally proved everything was possible. And I think it was really helpful that we were building these uh, sculptures and designs along the way. Uh, and here we finally ended up with uh, some nice mathematics. In the other example, curved crease folding, we've ended up with a lot of nice sculpture. You never know what you're going to get, but it's been productive in both cases. Um, a different kind of interdisciplinary work, just to mention it, I also like uh, working with roboticists. And there's this, um, this group uh, in the MIT Media Lab and Center for Bits and Atoms, um, where we've been working on how to, how to build physical robots. So this is a model of a robot. Uh, in 3D, they can fold into any 3D shape. So it's a universal chain that can fold into lots of different, exponentially many different shapes. Um, and here are a couple examples of real robots. This one is about a uh, meter in diameter. And you can, in this case, it only has four pieces, but you can, in principle, fold into two to the four different shapes. Um, this gets a lot more interesting when you have n pieces and also when the pieces are much smaller. So our latest robot, each piece is only one centimeter in diameter. And if you imagine, say, 100 or 1,000 of these joined together, uh, you get something like programmable matter, where you can reconfigure this chain into uh, any 3D shape you want. Uh, so if you have a long enough chain, you can do any resolution. Um, and I think this, it'll be exciting when you can start reusing matter in interesting ways, instead of having to just keep uh, making new stuff when you need new functionality. 
Uh, so that's the vision and, and how it's, it's fun, as you know, I'm sure, to take theoretical ideas and translate them into the real world. A great way to do that is collaborating with people who are experts in building robots and things like that. So that was the story of why you should have fun, do more than one thing at once, and collaborate with lots of people, and think about working across different disciplines and combining uh, interesting working. Uh, you get a lot of interesting problems at those boundaries between different areas, and uh, especially if you do more than one, so you can kind of hedge your bets and collaborate with the right people who know about the other side of the, the, the bridge, so to speak. Um, so that's pretty much all I wanted to say. One final word, uh, just wanted to say what a, how cool it is to get the Pressburger Award a year after my former student, Mihai Petrascu, who sadly died uh, a few months after he received this award. It, it's cool for us to share this award because I, I really miss him, and uh, this brings me a little bit closer to him. I'm sure many of you knew him as well. Um, and that's all. Thanks for watching. <laughs>